Hello, and welcome to episode 4 of E is not equal to MC squared, a podcast on sustainable investing. My name is Ignacy Jurjevich, and I will be your co-host for today's discussion on geothermal energy. Hi, my name is Nino Stubbe, and I will be your other host on today's podcast. I'm excited to join you for this discussion on what may well be one of the most unexplored renewable energy sources currently in use. So how about we dive right in? Ignacy, would you care to give us some background on geothermal energy and how it developed into its present state? Sure thing. So, geothermal power relies on the capture of heat energy that's generated underneath the Earth's surface. Diverse methods are then employed to harness that heat energy for use in many different applications, such as space heating and cooling, or electric power generation. You might be wondering, where does all this heat energy come from? Well, for one, a lot of geothermal geothermal heat comes from the radioactive decay of elements like potassium or uranium within the Earth's crust. Friction generated along the margins of tectonic plates is another major source of geothermal heat. This heat energy can then be captured by water in underground reservoirs, which then rises to the Earth's surface through fissures in the ground. Geysers are a great example of this. As you can see, the building blocks of geothermal energy have been around since the proverbial dawn of time. And believe it or not, people have been using geothermal energy for thousands of years. When the ancient Romans built baths around hot springs, they were using geothermal energy. As early as the 14th century, the first geothermal district heating system was installed in France. And in 1913, engineers in Italy built the first geothermal electric power plant. Geothermal energy is definitely one of the oldest renewable energy sources. And yet, we have only just scratched the surface of its potential. Interesting. You mentioned that geothermal energy has more than one use. It can deliver electricity, of course, but also has the potential to power district heating systems or to provide coolness in warmer regions and months. Could you maybe talk us through the technology that enables these many applications of geothermal energy? Yeah, no problem. As you said, geothermal energy is incredibly versatile and can be harnessed in several different ways. One common use of geothermal energy is in what's called direct use applications. In direct use applications, heated water is pumped straight from the ground into a set of tubes that might run through houses, swimming pools, or greenhouses. As the hot water passes through the tubes, it dissipates heat energy that warms the surroundings. Another common use of geothermal energy is in what's called geothermal heat pumps. These take advantage of the relatively stable temperature conditions within the first 20 feet of the Earth's surface to either heat or cool buildings. In warmer months, the geothermal heat pump can take in warm surface air and transfer its heat to a fluid, like water, via a heat exchanger. The warmed fluid is then circulated through a series of underground pipes, where its heat is dispersed to the cooler surrounding rocks, soil, and groundwater. In cooler months, the pump is reversed. Heat energy stored in the relatively warm ground is transferred to the fluid passing through the underground pipes, and the warmed fluid is then pumped back up to the surface where where its heat energy can be transferred to the surrounding air. The final application of geothermal energy is, of course, electric power generation. This can take place in one of three main ways. The first, dry steam operations, collect natural steam that rises from wells up to 30,000 feet underground. The high-pressure steam is funneled directly into a turbine that drives an electric generator. Flash steam plants, on the other hand, utilize pressured, pressurized high-temperature water instead of steam. This water is drawn from beneath the surface into large containers at the surface, called flash tanks. The large pressure differential between the surface and the ground causes the water to vaporize within the flash tank, and the resulting steam is then used to turn the electricity generating turbine. Finally, we have binary cycle plants, 
These transfer heat from geothermally heated groundwater to a secondary working fluid like ammonia or hydrocarbons that is more volatile and thus vaporizes with greater ease. A heat exchanger is, is used to transfer heat from the water that's pumped up to the surface to the working fluid that's contained in the secondary system of pipes. The heated secondary fluid then vaporizes and can be used to power the generating turbine. In all cases, the hot groundwater that's used for power generation can be pumped back into the geothermal well. Even excess steam can be condensed back into water and returned to the ground for future use. This is what makes geothermal power a renewable energy source. I see. All this sounds quite reasonable. The technology does not seem too complicated relative to emerging and existing energy sources. Speaking of comparisons, does geothermal energy carry any significant advantage over the technology we use today? Oh, definitely. Since geothermal power requires no combustion, it has a much lower carbon footprint than traditional energy sources like coal or oil. In fact, the average geothermal power plant generates one-eighth of the carbon emissions associated with a typical coal power plant. As ever more stringent regulations on carbon emissions are imposed around the world, you can expect geothermal energy with its low carbon footprint to gain popularity. You might be telling yourself, all of this sounds well and good, but surely geothermal's reduced carbon footprint must come at a cost. If this is the case, then I'm happy to tell you that the price premium for geothermal energy is not nearly as high as that of other renewable energy sources. In fact, once a geothermal plant is constructed, the cost of extracting and delivering geothermal energy is in line with the cost of coal. Geothermal power costs around 3.6 cents per kilowatt hour versus 3.2 cents for coal. What's more, the annual cost of pumping water and steam from the ground does not fluctuate from year to year, while the same cannot be said about the cost of coal or oil. Geothermal energy is also incredibly effective in its heating and cooling applications. Geothermal heat pumps, for instance, use 25-50% to 50 less energy than conventional heating and cooling systems. Keeping in mind that cooling and heating is the single biggest use of electricity in homes, a shift to geothermal heat pumps could translate into big savings on household power bills. And how does the geothermal energy compare to other renewable energy sources like wind or solar power? I briefly touched upon this a moment ago, but I think it's important to stress again. Geothermal energy has a lower levelized cost of electricity than all other renewable energy sources except for biomass. Besides, geothermal plants are relatively inexpensive to maintain. Just think about the main components of geothermal heating and power installations, such as pumps, heat exchangers, or turbines. Unlike photovoltaic cells, all of these are proven technologies that have been employed in the past and should thus pose minimal maintenance issues. Geothermal power has another big advantage over solar and wind power in particular. While solar panel and panels and wind turbines are at the mercy of prevailing weather conditions, hot water can be pumped from the ground at any time of day. It doesn't matter if it's sunny, cloudy, or windy. Geothermal energy works 24-7, while solar and wind power is available only one-third of that time. And since a significant portion of the geothermal infrastructure runs underground, geothermal energy tends to be more appealing to the eye than large wind farms and solar, solar panel installations. All of this sounds great. You did mention, however, that geothermal energy may be one of the more unexplored sources of clean power. The current cumulative installed capacity of a geothermal energy is, what, around 14 gigawatts? Solar and wind, by contrast, have been installed capacity over 500 and 600 gigawatts respectively. That's 40 times more than geothermal energy. If geothermal energy has all these advantages, what obstacles have prevented it from growing at the scale that solar and wind energy have? 
Well, no energy solution is perfect, and geothermal power is no exception. While geothermal power is unaffected by weather or time of day, it is constrained by location. Remember that groundwater or steam that's used in geothermal installations must carry enough energy in the form of heat in order to be effective. Heating and cooling applications require geothermal resources ranging between 122 and 302 degrees Fahrenheit, while electricity generation requires water or steam that's heated to at least 345 degrees Fahrenheit. As you can imagine, these conditions can only be met, be met in appropriate groundwater reservoirs that have adequate water recharge, sufficient caprock insulation to prevent immediate heat loss, and enough permeability to allow fluids to rise to the surface. These conditions usually limit the construction of geothermal power plants to areas with recent volcanic activity or which lie along tectonic plate boundaries. And unfortunately, hot water and steam cannot be carried long distances from the geothermal reservoir. If hot groundwater were piped further than one mile, the degree of heat loss would render the fluid ineffective at powering a turbine. The challenge of locating appropriate geothermal energy wells also makes the creation of new geothermal plants risky and capital intensive. Often, exploration activities result in so-called dry holes, which produce steam in amounts too low to be exploited economically. Consider also that geothermal power plants have the largest commercially, av commercially available minimum power unit, which means that they can only produce large chunks of capacity. All of this contributes to high upfront costs. While utility-scale solar energy maxes out at approximately $1,250 per kilowatt hour, the upfront cost of geothermal energy ranges from 4,000 to 6,000 kilowatt hours, dollars per kilowatt hour. Finally, there are limits to the intensity with which geothermal wells can be exploited. After 20 to 30 years of continuous use, the rate of heat extraction at a geothermal well can exceed the natural heat replenishment rate, leading to a decrease in energy output over time. Thankfully, the lifespan of a geothermal energy source can be extended either by drilling new wells or by recharging the water supply. That's a bummer. Do you think that these limitations might be resolved as geothermal energy matures? Oh yes. Technological progress is already addressing some of the main limitations of geothermal energy. As I just mentioned, it can be hard to find and tap into suitable groundwater reservoirs. But what if we were able to create our own water reservoirs almost where we want them. This is the basic premise behind new forms of geothermal energy extraction, called enhanced geothermal systems or hot fractured rock. You can think of these systems as being slightly similar to geothermal heat pumps, but operating much deeper in the ground. Enhanced geothermal systems usually consist of two wells drilled about 330 feet apart. High-pressure water is injected into low-permeability rock, like fractured granite, 16,500 feet underground via one of the wells. As the high-pressure water circulates through a network of fissures in the hot rock formation, it accumulates heat energy, and can then be pumped back up to the Earth's surface through the second well. This might all sound complicated, but it works. In a 1997 pilot study in France, engineers achieved a flow rate of 25 kg per second at above 459 degrees Fahrenheit between the two wells. This is more than enough heat to power a typical binary cycle geothermal power plant. And since then, several geothermal power plants employing enhanced geothermal systems have been put into use, including in Germany and Australia. Other tests are exploring the feasibility of using water from depleted oil reservoirs. As believe it or not, water is present naturally in onshore and offshore oil wells. And as these wells get depleted, water forms an ever greater part of the fluids that are extracted, up to 90% in fact. 
Today, an average of three to five barrels of hot water are produced for every one barrel of oil. Scientists estimate that this superheated water from oil fields could be harnessed to produce up to 15 gigawatts of geothermal energy, which is more than the entire current output of the geothermal industry. Such a solution would leverage existing oil wells, meaning that it could potentially avoid the large in initial investment that's required to scout and drill geothermal, geothermal reservoirs. With all this in mind, do you think investors should care about investing geothermal energy? Personally, I wonder what the future might hold for geothermal energy market and what firms will emerge as leaders in the field. There's no denying that geothermal energy hasn't grown at nearly the same pace as solar and wind power for the past couple of decades. The installed capacity for geothermal energy worldwide is just above 14 gigawatts, which is way below that of wind, 600 gigawatts, and solar power, 500 gigawatts. But depending on how you look at it, this means that there is substantial potential for growth in the geothermal industry. So far, the biggest barrier for geothermal energy has been the prohibitively risky and expensive early stage development, which discouraged investment from the private sector. New geothermal extraction methods, however, are leveling these barriers. If old oil wells can be reliably tapped for geothermal energy, or if enhanced geothermal systems become more widespread, initial capital expenditures for geothermal plants will decrease. Public-private alliances have also helped mitigate risks associated with the early stages of geothermal development. These developments create a brighter outlook for the future of geothermal power. The International Energy Agency predicts growth of 28% or 4 gigawatts over the current installed geothermal capacity during the next five years. By 2050, geothermal power could reach 200 gigawatts of installed capacity, as opposed to the 14 gigawatts we have today. Much of this growth is expected to happen in the Asia-Pacific region, where large capacity additions are already underway in Indonesia and the Philippines. Currently, however, the US leads both in terms of installed capacity, which is 24% of the global total, and the number of projects under development, with over 150 geothermal projects already underway in 13 states. In fact, the U.S. Department of Energy estimates that U.S. geothermal electricity capacity will increase 26-fold by 2050, from 3.6 gigawatts today to 60 gigawatts in 2050. What's peculiar about the geothermal industry is that it has few players and is front capital expenditure exp extensive, expensive. Sorry. This leads some experts to speculate that consolidation is bound to happen. What's also interesting about the geothermal industry is that the many areas of geothermal energy production are dominated by different firms. Fuji, Mitsubishi, and Toshiba have a 67% market share in direct steam turbines, while Ormat Technologies dominates the market for binary systems. Halliburton and Schlumberger, meanwhile, lead in the sector for drilling services. The diversified nature of these firms minimizes their exposure to risk in geothermal ventures, while their market leadership position puts them in a good spot to acquire smaller firms. Of all these firms, Ormat Technologies deserves a special mention as the only vertically integrated company in the geothermal sector. Because of its vertical integration, the company has managed to reduce upfront capital expenses on projects, as well as the operating cost of power plants, and also to increase electricity margins, so as to become one of the biggest geothermal companies in the world. As of 2019, Ormat owned and operated 6% of the world's geothermal energy generation facilities, and its shares had bested the S&P 500 return over the past five years. If Ormat's recent performance is any indication, the geothermal industry seems to be on an upward trajectory, with lots of yet untapped potential ahead of it. 
It may not be quite as popular as solar and wind energy, but geothermal power is definitely worth keeping an eye on, especially as the barriers to entry into the sector are gradually getting lower and lower. Thanks, Ignasi. It's been great talking to you. Don't forget to tune into the next and final episode of our podcast if E does not equal MC squared. In it, we'll conclude our discussion of sustainable investing with another look at a relatively unknown form of renewable energy, wave power. Sounds great. I am looking forward to it.